In today's video, we're going to look at how to answer those weird questions in physics exams that I call anything can come up questions. So in those kind of questions, you come out of the exam thinking, oh, question six was really weird. How are we expected to know I've never been taught anything to do with this certain topic? OK, or you might be thinking, well, actually, how can I even start answering it? You might not know where to start. You might have left it blank. And now the idea is being, uh, physics exams always contain context. Context means real world situations. So they might contain things that you haven't learned specifically, but are related to real life. However, top tips are to breathe and um, to take your time with it. Maybe leave it till uh, the end if you're finding it really tricky. And the idea is it's supposed to be difficult, but you need to think what part of the course, what part of the specification could this be about and look for clues in the question. Because the idea is, and trust me, I've looked at every single past paper, exam papers can only ask you about something that's on the specification. So if you have revised well, you will know something that can help you find the answer. So let's have a look at some examples of how you can go about doing One this. Of the ways you can make sure you are best placed to deal with these kind of questions is to look at the specification. So this, for example, is a QA one. Now, it is really, 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 really important um, because there'll be things in there your teachers might not tell you, and that includes me, okay? As your teachers are not as useful as the specification because all exams can do is give you content based on what's in the specification. So I'll give you an example. Um, this was the first question from 2021 paper. It says about a car charging station having direct potential difference, and then asks you what direct potential difference means. Now, a lot of students, mine included, started talking about current because they had learned about alternating current. However, the specification doesn't actually mention alternating current at all. It only mentions alternating potential difference. And this was picked up in the examiner's report who said teachers aren't teaching to the specification. So my top tip would be to try and go through the specification as much as you can. Lots of it you'll know already, um, but go through and try and highlight and make notes on things that might be useful um, to help deal with those trickier questions. For the first question we're going to have a look at, um, we've got this question here from the 2021 uh, physics paper. Um, and it talks about um, polonium decaying into a nucleus. We've got alpha particles emitted here, uh, lead particles. Um, but the question itself looks really confusing. It's almost like another language. You've got a uh, polonium arrow and then it's PB lead plus an alpha particle. Then you've got lead decays, emits a beta particle and forms this thing called bismuth. Um, and if I were an exam uh, myself and in GCC, I would be a little bit taking some time to actually digest what this is, what is going on here. Okay, there's a lot of information to be able to process. Um, but what the question is actually asking you for is not too complex. Okay, so it's one of those huh, um, interesting questions, a little bit different to normal. Uh, but the question says, explain how these three decays result in a nucleus of the original element uh, polonium. Okay. Now, to be able to answer this question for three marks, I will show you how to do it in a second. However, you can get marks in this question just for saying basic things about each decay. Okay. Now, for the original element, we should know that an element is defined by its atomic number. So each element has a different atomic number. You'll know that from chemistry from the periodic table. So with that in mind, let's then talk about for each of these three decays, what happens to the atomic number. Now, first one it tells us is alpha, so I'm going to talk about that one first. So we should know alpha decay. If we know um, the atomic number and mass number of an alpha particle, we know the atomic number is two. So that these numbers here, from polonium to lead in this example, the atomic number will go down by two. So for alpha decay, um, therefore, the atomic number decreases by two. Now, as well as that, we also should know what happens to the atomic number for beta decay. So let's have a look at beta decay. Uh, now, the um, mass and atomic number for beta decay is a bit of a weird one because um, it's minus one down here and zero at the top. So what that means is that wherever the atomic number is here, it has to be one higher here because this is minus one. Now, in addition to that, what also happens inside the nucleus is a neutron changes into a proton. Okay. Either way, though, if you know this is minus one, then you'll know this has to be one bigger than it was initially. Okay. So beta decay, what we'd say is that the atomic number would increase by one. Okay, now let's then finalize. Now, by the way, that's two marks already just for stating two facts that we know. If you revise well, you'll know these facts. Last mark is for applying to the question. Now, the original element, polonium, if you've got one alpha decay, so that means the atomic number goes down by two, and then you've got one beta decay, goes up by one, another beta decay goes up by one, minus two, plus one, plus one, makes it zero. So what that means is for our final mark, we could say so that the um, atomic number of the final nucleus is basically the same as the original. Okay, so the atomic number of the final um, 
um, you say atom here, it's usually fine, but nucleus is a better word, is the same um, as the original or at the start. Okay, so that's a good example of like a really difficult question, but if you keep your wits about you, make sure you know about your decays, then you should be able to get marks here. Okay, the next question we're going to have a look at um, is from Combined Science this time, uh, from June 2020, um, and it's talking about um, glucometer and glucose, which sounds like a biology question. I know this question confused people um, a lot when it came out. Um, you've got this massive graph on this side here, um, okay, which was read through the question and we'll pick out how we'd know how to solve it. So it says a glucometer uses the resistance, that sounds physics-y, uh, of a blood sample to calculate the glucose concentration in blood. A blood sample is put into a small tube, put into a glucometer, blood acts as a resistance wire. And it shows the graph shows the relationship between resistance and glucose. Okay, so we've got glucose on our x-axis, and it's got blue resistance on the y-axis. The question's on the other side. Now, the question says the glucometer applies a potential difference of 0.9 volts across a blood sample, and the concentration is 0.98 grams a liter. Now, there's no one in this country who has learned in the context of physics about glucose concentration in blood. However, if you look at the question, you can like unravel what it's all talking about, because the question actually asks you to determine the current in the blood sample. Now let's look at our clues. We've got volts up here. That sounds like they might be helpful when working out current. And we've also got, if we look back at the previous bit of the question, we've got resistance on the graph, okay? So in your brain, you've got to make that connection then to say, okay, current, volts, and resistance, then I know there's an equation. I can look at my equation sheet and know there's an equation that links those three things together. However, where does this come in? Well, if we look at the grams per liter, the glucose concentration, that comes up from the graph, okay? So it's 0.98 grams per liter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the resistance from this graph. So let's go up from 0.98, use a ruler to do it properly, to the graph, and then go along, so as accurately as we can, even though I'm doing it quickly. Um, and I'm gonna say that, so that's seven, I'm gonna say that's 7.5, um, okay? There'll be a range on your answer there. So what we then know from that is that actually the resistance I was to write down here in, in case we get confused, um, is 7.5 ohms. Now, let's write that into our equation. Let's see what else we need to know. Uh, we don't know the current, that's what we're trying to find out. The volts we know already, that's 0.9. And therefore, at this point, it's just a regular equation. We've just got one variable to find, two others we know. So we would have to therefore divide 0.90 by 7.5 um, and see what the current gives us, okay? And in this case, that happens to be 0.12. Uh, it's within the range on the mark scheme. It doesn't have to be exactly 7.5 because you're reading from a graph. Okay, we've got another question about radioactivity here. Um, and the graph shows, it says figure 11 shows how the activity of four different radioactive isotopes, A, B, C, and D, uh, changes over time. Now, uh, we've got time on the x-axis, activity on the y-axis. Now, uh, let's look at what they're gonna ask us about it. Uh, the question says, write the isotopes, so the four isotopes, in order of increasing stability of their nuclei. Okay, and then explain your answer. Now this question was really poorly answered in the GCSE, probably because it was the end of the paper, and um, people were a bit tired by that point. Um, but if you just keep um, a bit of awareness about what the graph is similar to, you'll be able to answer this question a lot better than you might think. So let's have a look back at the graph. Um, okay, now we should know that these graphs might look quite similar to graphs you've seen before um, when we work out half-life, okay? Now when you work out half-life, you don't need to here, um, there's no requirement to do so, um, but you use our activity or number of nuclei on that axis and time on this axis, okay? Now the steeper the line is, that means the shorter the half-life, and the shallower the half-life is, that will mean a longer half-life. So we can use that information to try and figure out, well actually, what is going on here, what the activity is overall. So the first thing to spot here is that C is the shallowest line. So shallowest line means it has a longest half-life. So longest half-life um, means that actually, in terms of stability, that means it is pretty stable. It's not decaying very quickly at all. So let's add that one in there. So most stable, um, that's gonna be C at this end. Next, we've got to order the other three into um, some sort of order. Now for that, uh, C's got the shallowest gradient. Uh, if you were to order the rest of them, D is actually the steepest overall. Uh, then we've got B um, and A kind of after that. And also A uh, doesn't decrease by activity in that much over the period of time, okay? So B, B, A, C is the final order. Um, and the <coughs> explanation um, is really where you get your marks here, okay? So the idea is that, as we've just said, a substance, a longer half-life, so I'm just gonna put it in note form, okay? So longer half-life means um, a more stable 
nuclei. Nil stable means less likely to decay, basically. Okay, and that is what applies to C, what we just talked about. Okay, so therefore you'd say, and you've got to link it to the idea of half life from that graph. So um, D B A C uh, is in order from smallest or lowest half life to highest. Okay, so even if you don't get those um, marks necessarily um, uh, like perfectly, um, the idea longer half life stable nuclei um, is one that comes up regularly, and that's how you unpick it from that question. And the last question we're having a look at in today's video uh, is about electricity, in particular static electricity. Now, I'm not going to have a look at this one here um, just because I think it's relatively straightforward. Why do objects become uh, charged? Um, also, transfer of electrons uh, when, they, uh, when there's friction between them. Um, have a look at my static electricity video about that. I want to talk about this one here because this is another example of a little demonstration that is unlikely that many people in the country would have done in a physics lab at GCSE. However, there is enough information for you to figure out what's going on. Okay, so I'll introduce the, the demonstration first, then we'll look at the quest question on the next slide. So we've got a balance and we've got a negatively charged plastic rod. Now, it says there's insulating material here, um, and it, then it says there's another charged rod being held stationary above the rod on the balance. They do not touch each other, so there's a gap between them. Now, what we notice is that the mass goes up a little bit, not by much, but by about 0.1 um, grams. And the question on the other side says, essentially, why does that happen? Okay. Now, this question was pretty poorly answered in the GCSE, but I'll explain why, how we can answer a question like that. So what we know then, and your clue is in the question, it says why is the reading on the balance increases is because it tells you um, that there is a charge rod above it, and it tells you this has negative charge on it. Okay. Now what we do know about anything to do with static electricity, which they've kind of um, given us a hint about already, is that if I have a rod um, that is negatively charged, and I put it close to another rod that's negatively charged, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to repel. So this rod will therefore exert force downwards on this one which will mean that the reading goes up slightly. So there's a force downwards, okay? So that's the information. You've got to unpick it from the question here. This one is negative. This one is, must also be negative for there to be um, an increase in mass. And so how would you write it? It would look something um, like this. Uh, so we'd say there is an additional, or there is a downwards force, is um, an additional or an extra um, downwards force force um, on the balance okay um, that's a mark by itself by just saying there's a downwards force um, and that's because the rod m is negatively charged and therefore and repels the um, uh, what do we call it on the bottom the um, the other negatively charged rod okay so you could even say here, um, you know, two negatives, um, negatives repel each other if you wanted to. Okay, uh, right, I'm going to finish off this question because I think it's a little bit tricky as well. And it's a good chance to just revise a couple of uh, key things with static electricity. Um, so the question talks about a zero error, uh, which is not important. Um, zero error would only be important if you were measuring an absolute value. Um, the reason why it's not important here uh, is because only the change um, in reading uh, is being measured, not the absolute value or the actual value itself. Uh, and this question down bottom here um, seems a bit tricky at first. It says negatively charged rod is head near, held near an earth conductor. Why does a spark jump between the charged rod and the conductor? There are so many questions like this. There are some variation of a charged rod being held close to something else or a spark or an electric shock. Um, the explanation is always the same. So even though it seems like a tricky question, uh, you've just got to learn the mark scheme for this type of question. So what you'd say is that there's essentially a large um, potential difference uh, between two objects. Okay, um, I'm just going to say a large PD uh, between um, the conductor uh, and the, um, the rod. So that causes, um, this causes um, electrons to move to or current to flow. So you could say that's uh, current and they will flow and um, we've got to say the direction where they're going to go um, so from the rod to the conductor okay now obviously not all questions about rods and conductors but that idea of a high potential difference and then the electrons moving from one to another 
um, called an electric current. That's where you get lightning, that's where you get electric shocks from, um, and anything to do with um, sparking as well. So I hope you found that useful. Um, just bear in mind there will always be one um, tricky uh, question, at least on your exam, okay, where you think, oh my God, what's going on there? However, if you've learned to rise well and you've rised uh, close to the specification, watched all my videos, and you will be able to answer it, you've just got to unpick what is the question asking about.